Hi, my name is Sandy Levin and I'm the Executive Director at LA Law Library. I was lucky enough to be able to interview some amazing people who have overcome adversity in their lives to achieve success, respect, and great satisfaction in their legal careers. This short video shares some of their personal struggles, triumphs, insights, and advice. If you want to hear more from any of the people in this video, make a note of the name because the full interviews are available on our website at www.lalawlibrary.org slash adversity. No matter how great their success is, one message was universal. You're not alone. Everyone has challenges. How you handle those challenges will affect the rest of your life. Judge Deborah Sanchez remembers the challenges of being a teenage mom from the housing projects. When I uh, started school, I was at a community college and I didn't have a car. I, didn't, I was on welfare. I didn't have um, resources. The college was a few miles away and so I had to walk back and forth and I find babysitters and scratch up money for books and I think that from the very beginning, it just seemed like an impossible task, but the goal was um, so sweet, you know, to have my son in a better place. And I think also um, just uh, being, being low income and living in a housing project, there was a lot of uh, drug use and um, things that were going on in those, in those housing projects where it just felt it was very unsafe for my son and myself, but it was, I just couldn't wait to get out of school. I just couldn't wait to advance and move away and, you know, to put my son in a better position and as well as myself. Louis Lavin, a Cuban immigrant and now the first openly gay justice on the Second District Court of Appeal, recalls discouragement and discrimination when he was younger. I remember at times even some teachers, although I had very uh, encouraging teachers, would at times say to me, you really should learn um, how to uh, fix a car because you'd be lucky just to go to vocational school. So I certainly had some doubters um, and certainly some people in grade school that would be very surprised that I actually went on to, uh, to law school and actually then became a judge. I'm, I'm openly gay and certainly being gay and the late um, 70s, early 80s was a time of a lot of intolerance. Um, even as an example, I mean, I went to law school, as I said, at Harvard and Cambridge, which people think of being this very liberal, progressive town. And I just remember um, landlords asking me questions about my sexual orientation and whether um, they would rent to me as a student. Um, and I'm not sure at the time there's anything I did other than try to find a landlord that would actually rent to me. But um, it really sort of focused my interest in civil rights and um, uh, justice in general and why I sort of got into the law and why I eventually uh, wanted to become a judge. Listen to Silvia Torres Guillen, the daughter of Mexican immigrants and the first in her family to get a college degree. There were people who didn't believe in me and didn't think that I'd be able to go where I was hoping to go to. So if I said I was going to apply early admission to Harvard, um, I remember one person laughed. And, you know, I don't know how much I believed in his disbelief, you know, or his, um, but I just applied anyway, and I just hoped that my hard work would pay off. Betty Boyd recounts that she faced challenges even beyond her physical disability of growing up blind. I never thought that I 
could get my education just because I grew up in my family where if you're disabled, you're really not worth much and you're not able to, you're not considered to be able to do very much. So getting each of those degrees was just a highlight in my life. One of the most powerful tools in overcoming challenges is to keep them in perspective, both within your own life and as compared to others. Martha Carrillo talks about perspective based on her upbringing as an undocumented immigrant in a single parent household. Culturally, when it's very different circumstances that you're facing, it, it becomes difficult. But I remember one time when I was in, in the academic setting, you know, you come from an inner city schools and sometimes you are not as well prepared as you wish you were compared to other kids. And one time I was studying and my mother called me, my mother cleaned houses for a living, and she said, um, can you come help me clean the house? Because I have two to do and it's just too much. And I said, okay, oh, hey, mom, my classes are later on. I can go help you. And I'm sorry. But I was in law school. And I went and I cleaned this house. Because she just couldn't do two in one day. And I cleaned somebody's toilet very, very well. I got on my knees and I cleaned everything perfectly, made my mother proud. That experience put, gave me perspective. The next time I thought law school was hard, I always thought of my mother that day. And I said, physical labor is hard. Getting down on your knees and cleaning somebody's toilet really, really good, the way that you wouldn't even clean your own, that's hard. Coming home tired, exhausted, where you, you don't even have the energy to play with your children just to put food on the table, that's hard. Studying the rule of perpetuities and contracts, that's not hard at all. I could do that. <laughs> Rose Ochi, sent to a Japanese internment camp as a child, went on to legendary achievements in her life, including establishing Manzanar as a national historic site. She recalls here how putting her circumstances in perspective helped her deal with challenges and doubts on her path. I've always, when I went to Loyola, I was not prepared. I had been a school teacher. And I remember uh, looking at my classmates, sons of lawyers and judges, and I turned to a friend of mine, Brenda Shockley, and I said, how can we compete with them? You know? And she said to me, Rose, keep in mind, if they started where we started, they may not be here. Sometimes the perspective that comes from hardship is that it makes you feel grateful. I remember one really smart um, friend of mine from junior high school, and I later learned that in high school she was killed, um, just a drive-by shooting. So when you hear about those stories and all those people who had ho so many hopes and dreams, who don't get to fulfill them, um, but you're so blessed uh, to have them, that you know, I, I, I do feel very, very grateful. The ability to believe in yourself, even when you're being told that you're not valued, can carry you through to your goals. California's Chief Justice and the first non-Caucasian Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of California offers these wise words. One of the things I would tell them is there are some experiences that are outside of their control. And for those kinds of experiences that are outside of your control, you have to adjust your mind as to how you interpret them and take away the best possible lessons and lessons that will strengthen you in your life going forward. But there are also experiences that you can control. And in those experiences that you can control, know this, that nothing changes if nothing changes. So you have to be the architect of your life and build in the change and not wait for it to happen to you. And I think that you need to do that with belief in yourself and frankly, to disregard many times the negative judgment of others. 
So it's about believing in yourself and making the best of the situations that are out of your control. Greg Barnes knew some tough times growing up in a mixed-race family in the South Bronx and then as a ward of the court. Here's his advice. For me, the most important thing was to value yourself and not to doubt yourself and realize that the talents that you have may not be recognized by others, but those are the talents you'll fall back on um, as you move on in life. For example, when I'm in court in trial, I don't find myself particularly nervous because I recall being in very, very scary situations uh, and getting myself out of it. Jackie Lacey was the first in her working class family to go to college, and she went on to become the first woman and the first African American district attorney of Los Angeles County. There's one moment that stands out in my life when I was uh, a freshman in college. Uh, I had a, um, a biology class. Biology was not my major. I was a social science major. But um, um, I got an A on a test. And the teacher's assistant, who was passing out the grades, um, looked at me in a very joking way and said, well, who did you copy off of? I don't know if she realized it, but I was an affirmative action student. And uh, one of the few minorities in that class. And I really felt uh, that while her remark was meant as a joke, it was um, an incredible diss, uh, you know, a disrespectful act to my intelligence. Along the way, little things like that have happened. But I I've learned I, I have a thick skin now. Uh, it's really hard uh, to... To, to offend me or get under my skin. I really uh, realize that a lot of these things that, that happen just don't matter. Yolanda Barrera, now a successful attorney, grew up as a migrant farm worker and a translator for Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. All my life, um, I have suffered various kinds of discrimination, starting with, of course, uh, being Hispanic, um, being a woman, um, I have had to fight against that all of my life. It was something I was prepared for, however, because my mother used to tell me stories of when she grew up in Texas, and there were a lot of signs in various establishments that said, no Mexicans or dogs allowed. Um, so it, it wasn't something that I did not expect but it would still come up in, in the context of close friends where it would shock me. Um, for example, um, I had a best friend for several years until we got into middle school and then she told me she couldn't be a friend with, with me anymore because her mother said that I was a dirty Mexican. And um, uh, I was shocked I, I wasn't shocked someone would say that because it wasn't the first time I had heard that. But I was shocked that it, we had been friends for several years and, and that it just came a point where her mother wouldn't allow her to be friends with me anymore. Um, some people refused to sit in a car with me uh, and they specifically said because I was Hispanic. Um, so sometimes there isn't anything you can do about it except show class. And um, other people around will see what your reaction is and will, will be impressed by the fact that you don't yell and scream and punch and kick and try to kill the person even though in your mind that's what you feel like doing. Um, and instead you show class, you show refinement, you show that you have an education. Um, but sometimes there are things you can do. Um, for example, in, in my employ various employments, I have noted discrimination against Hispanics, against women. So wherever I've worked, I've always been on the hiring committee. Uh, even now, uh, even though I'm a solo practitioner, I belong to a hiring committee with respect to indigent defense panel work and in federal court. 
Selma Smith agrees that you may not have the ability to control how others treat you, but you do have the power to control your own response. I went to the courthouse. I said, this is not on any pending matter. I would like to see judge so-and-so and, -so. and um, gave him my card. And so he went back to the chambers and um, with my card, came back out, handed me my card and said, the judge said to tell you he doesn't have lady lawyers come to him to ask in his chambers. And there I was with my card. I already president of the women lawyers. It, it takes a lot before it will get me. And um, I thought to myself, well, this is his mistake. And um, uh, not everything has to get you a person. So uh, I, don't, uh, I don't respond in that way. Your attitude can give you power over your life. Craig Barnes's attitude helped him turn hard times into something positive. I think what felt most unfair, um, there was a period of time when I was a ward of the court, and I, I was at a place called Children's Center, and uh, it was probably for about 10 months, and my parents um, were, were not together, and so it was just me and my sister. My brother was put into a reform school, and I felt the whole thing was really unfair because I just ripped out of my regular life and had to live um, as a ward of the court. And, and what that meant is I was with a, a whole bunch of other um, young people who were pulled apart from the families. Either the parents died or they were abandoned. And um, it was essentially prison because there were bars in the windows, and, and I felt that it was just unfair to, this, to have this happen. As an adult, I look back and I realize it wasn't anybody doing it to me, but it was just an unfair um, experience in my mind that I'd had to go through that. It became a source of inspiration for me because as I left the institution on March the 5th, 1965, I vowed I'd never forget the day. And I vowed that I would not allow that kind of thing to happen to me, that I would do all I could to make sure I could stand on my own because I don't want to feel as if I was subject to someone else's will. And it felt like being incarcerated for a crime I didn't commit. Um, and it, it became a source of uh, uh, not just motivation, but inspiration. In fact, when I got out of there in March, I had to finish the rest of the whole school year in basically two or three months. And although that was difficult, the experience kind of hardened my res resolve. California's Chief Justice remembers a turning point in her career when she decided to stand up for herself. I would often find in court, in trial, that the other attorney, the defense attorney, because I was a prosecutor, would interrupt me in the middle of sentences, in the middle of argument, in the middle of questions. And this happened over and over and over again. And the judge never said, stop, I need to have a complete sentence, you'll have your turn. It became very adversarial. So about six months in, I recognized this, felt I was not being uh, treated fairly. And so I took this tactic to finally start yelling in the middle of the defense attorney's argument. And I started, and I remember this attorney, I remember the judge, how surprised they were that I started yelling in the middle of his closing argument. And the defense attorney said, she's interrupting me. And I said, you interrupted me first. And the judge said, I believe you're right, Ms. Cantill, and said, proceed. And so from then on, whenever I saw that encroachment, I'd jump in, plant my flag, and stare down the other side. Most successful people have stories to share about how someone gave them a hand or provided support, sometimes in unexpected or unpredictable ways. Sometimes all it takes is for someone to plant a seed. I was kind of a little bit of a delinquent. When I came back from camp, uh, World War II, I was called to dirty Jap, and, and it was go home. And so I got to grow up to be a very tough lady. And uh, I got involved in a lot of fights, and anybody wants to call me Jap. 
And while I wouldn't always win, but I get in a few licks. But I would say that that I uh, I grew up at Laguna Playground, which is now Ruben Salazar Playground in East LA. And the um, head of the the uh, Miss Langendorf, she felt that oh, this girl's going to become a juvenile delinquent. So she selected me to go to Unicamp, which is UCLA Underprivileged Children's Camp. And it was amazing because these counselors are UCLA students. They planted in my head that I'm going to UCLA and I'm going to be a teacher. So this is junior high, before junior high. So I had that in my mind. And so it didn't matter what happened at high school where they discouraged me. I, and I had to go through junior college in order to get to UCLA. So when I got there, you know, that was my dream. Jackie Lacey realized much later in life how her father had influenced her career. I think the most inspirational person, though, in my life was my father. Uh, he's been gone since 2008. Uh, and I didn't realize it at the time as a little girl. He was actually grooming me for an important position in the community. Uh, he would drag me to, uh, and I mean drag me to, um, breakfasts and lunches where political figures would speak. I had no interest in politics. He would recommend that I read certain leadership books when I was only interested in reading fiction. Um, he led by example. He was a no-nonsense kind of a guy, a very strong-willed individual. Uh, he put uh, God and his family first, and I realized in watching all of those things that, and all of the things that he did for me as a kid and as a teenager and as a young adult, uh, and, and an adult well into her 50s, that uh, he was preparing me for this uh, particular job. Martha Carrillo remembers how her mother's faith supported and inspired her. My mother always believed that she didn't have enough to give me to succeed. And I think just being either told by your teacher or by your parent, I believe in you. You can do anything. The having that faith, whether it comes from a teacher or your parents, is priceless. And it will give you so much success. I I'll give you another story, just bring home the point. When I was taking a bar exam, that I passed on the first time, I, my mother said to me, Mija, I don't have the money to give you for um, you know, the prep courses. They were very expensive. I had to work to earn the money to pay for them. I don't have any money. You know, I, I work for this lady, and her son is taking this course and this course. and I can't do that for you. She says, but I have faith in you. I believe that you could do this. And you know what? I have the Santo Niño de Atocha, which is a Catholic saint that she says, Anytime I ask him for anything, he always comes through. When your brother got tossed in jail or something, he, I say, take him out, and he, and he always comes through for me. So I'm going to tell him that you have to pass this bar. And I said, Mother, if I pass this bar on the first time, uh, you know, and she says, but you have to promise me that if you do pass, you have to go thank him, because that's part of the promise. You have to go to the church on your knees and thank him. But just, and I said, Mother, if I pass the first time, I will go from the house to the church, from the neighbor, you know, from our house to the church. She said, Marta Alicia, don't be silly. No, no, no. Just from the entrance of the church to the front, you have to thank him on your knees. And I said, I will do it on, on my knees, mother, if I pass. When I took it, I passed. My mother said, well, you're, I told you the Santo Nino was going to come through. You know, I, he always comes through for me. Now you have to go thank him. And I said, let's go. So it was my mother on one side and my grandmother on the other side. And we started on our knees and we started bawling and crying. And everybody said, who died? Who's dying? Is somebody dying in your family? And my mom said, no, my daughter's an attorney. But the moral of the story is that's all my mother could give me, faith, you know, faith in me that I could do this, her Catholic faith that somehow I could do this. And that was enough. Ms. Torres Guillén, who was raised in Boyle Heights, remembers how important it was to have support from teachers. Nothing happens on your own. Um, and I think that's something that I've learned more in life. Um, when I was in uh, junior high school at Stevenson Junior High School, I still remember Ms. Chauvin and Mr. Mitchell, who were my homeroom teacher and my algebra teacher, 
who told me to apply to A Better Chance, which is a program for um, uh, minority students. And they would distribute your high school application and the high school could accept you anywhere in the country. And I still think what would have happened had they not been there to, to say, we believe in you, um, you should apply and you should try to do something more. Uh, and, and I feel like I've had that along the way, whether it's teachers, but I think really teachers are so critical, um, especially where I came from. I mean, I, I didn't know lawyers, I didn't know judges, um, but I was surrounded by teachers and I was surrounded by my peers and teachers really care. Successful people persevere. They'll tell you, it's your life. Don't let anyone or anything stand in the way of what you want to accomplish. Attorney Tamiko Heron recalls how it felt to encounter an unfair obstacle and then push past it. I don't, I'm not the type of person that goes looking for issues, but I have to say something that sticks in my mind is as a new attorney. Um, I was 26 years old. I had my new attorney suit. I had my briefcase. I was working for legal services. I was representing a family um, in a family law dispute, a child, and a, a custody battle. And I went to the Palmdale Courthouse and I had my briefcase and my suit and my, you know, I was prepared to, for my hearing with the judge. And there was a bailiff outside the courtroom, and you had to see the, your, your name, of your, you know, your case number, and they were going to call you to come in. And he was standing there, and he said, attorneys, please. So I walked up to the door, and I was ready to go in, and he looked at me, and he said, ma'am, you have to wait outside. This is just for attorneys. And I said, sir, I am an attorney. And I handed him my business card, and I walked in, I checked in with the clerk. But at that moment, I had to take a deep breath because I thought, now, well, he asked for attorneys very clearly. I heard him and I walked in along with everyone else. And I wasn't sure at that moment if his hesitation to allow me in was, was because I looked so young. Was it because I was a woman and he was expecting, most of the attorneys at that time were men. Um, or was it because I was African-American? I wasn't sure why he stopped me and what that was about. But I just looked him in the eye and I was very proud to say I am an attorney. And I walked right in and I handled our affairs that day and the judge saw it my way and it was just, it was ultimately a very happy result. But I wasn't sure what motivated his response to me. Bobby Rimas is an example of someone who persevered despite discrimination and personal tragedy. Sometimes when the only choices are to give up or keep going, you just have to keep going. I did feel uh, inequality, not so much with race or sexual orientation, is with regards to the death of my brother. You know, he was um, murdered at the age of 17 when I was a sophomore at UCLA. And to me, that was very unfair. To me, that was, you know, what can you say? You know, my brother was... He was a star athlete at the, high, at the local high school that he was at. Um, and that's when I had to ponder, you know, how could this be, you know, how could this be bestowed upon my family? Like, what did they have, what have they done to deserve such, you know, such a calamity? And um, you have a choice, either you would deal with it head on or you could, you know, give up and go into a corner and call it a day. And I chose to do I chose to try to be, a, a, at best, um, a positive inspiration for my parents. Because since they only had two kids, I'm the only kid left, well, you know, you can make some red headways and, you know, make the people that doubt you turn around and say, wow, this person can actually do something positive. You know, this person, you know, who we had negative doubts about actually eventually became, you know, a full-time paralegal in the legal profession and also the head of one of the largest paralegal associations in the country, as well as a part-time professor. Facing it head on that despite perceptions, despite, you know, not just perceptions on the outside, but also insecurities within, that, you know, anything, anything that you really wanted to do can be done. It might take some hard work, it might take some time, but it can be accomplished. 
Listen to Luis Rodriguez, the first Latino president of the California State Bar Association. You're going to fail constantly throughout life. And that's something that many times we are afraid to talk about, the failures. And it's not a question of failing one, two, three, ten times throughout your life. That's not what matters. That's important. What matters is how you come out after those failures. What kind of person will you be after those failures? I've had a number of failures throughout my life. And one thing that I've learned throughout those failures is that, and it may sound kind of hokey, but it does make you strong. And how you perform, how you come out of a failure will, will determine what steps you will take as you progress as an individual. For Yolanda Barrera, getting to college definitely required perseverance. I think that the first time when I seriously doubted myself was when I was in high school. And I had met students who were going to college. And for the first time, I decided that I could go to college and I could be something other than an orange picker. And so I approached my counselor about that and he told me that I should not go to college, that it was not a good idea for me to go because he had known many excellent uh, and very intelligent, very smart Mexican-American youths who had gone to college and they had gone crazy. And so uh, my response was that that was not something I thought would happen with me. So his next argument was that I shouldn't go to college because it was very difficult to go to college. And um, I pointed out to him that I was number three in a class of over 500 graduating seniors. And therefore, I thought that my grades were good enough to be able to handle college. And uh, his next argument was that I knew that my parents didn't have any money, and so why was I insisting on going to college? And my response was that I had heard that they had financial aid in colleges, and so I thought that I could just apply for, for funding, for scholarships. And he told me there was no such thing, and whoever had told me that was lying to me, and that I should just go away. And, uh, that I, if I wanted to go beyond high school, I should maybe try to save some money, go to a cosmetology school, and that should be what I should do with my life. And so what I did about it is I just figured he was wrong. He had to be wrong. I went back to my counselor and I said, um, well, I, can you give me some addresses for some colleges? I'd like to go to college. And he refused to do that because he felt I shouldn't go to college. So I contacted some of the students that I had met, and um, they told me, just write to the university and just the school, the, the name of the city. That's it. You don't need an address. So I wrote to several um, of the universities, and I got back packets with all kinds of information how to apply. I filled them out. I sent them in, but there was one big problem, and that big problem was in those days, I don't know if it still happens, but in those days, a counselor had to sign off to send the transcripts to the university. And my counselor refused to sign off. I didn't know what to do at that point, so I thought I lost. I had a, later a conversation with Cesar Chavez. Um, and Cesar Chavez was outraged about what had happened. And he asked me whether uh, what was my, my preference in terms of schools? And I said, I would like to go to San Jose State. So he said, let me see what I can do. And snapped his fingers somehow, some way. Uh, the next thing I knew, I did get a letter from San Jose State saying that I was accepted. Richard Lewis, one of the first African-American students at John C. Freeman High School, reflects on the power of perseverance. I, I think it was Frank Sinatra had a song that says, you know, you might get knocked down, but most important thing, you get back up and you keep on fighting. Uh, because, as I said, uh, you can, the lives of great men, 
do remind us that we can make our lives different and sublime, and we can leave our footsteps in the sand of time. You just have to make the uh, effort to do that. And it's not so much that that's your goal. It's just that you have this life and you want to make it worthwhile. And so at the end, you could say, you know, I've, I've done something to make this a little bit of a better world. Perseverance was the key to overcoming the challenges of being a blind law student, according to Betty Boyd. I was the first blind person at my law school who couldn't read books, and so they had to develop a unique system in which they would order the CDs from the publishers, and sometimes the publishers didn't have the books already scanned, so I would actually have to spend extra hours scanning page after page after page, and that would take me a lot of hours. And I didn't sleep very much because it also took me two hours to commute to school because I didn't drive and I had to use public transportation and sometimes I used paratransit and they didn't show up and I'd be out there at like 10 o'clock at night, you know, wondering when my ride is going to come. So it was really difficult. And law school is really hard in itself without the extra transportation and the reading disability issues. I remember spending two hours on one case in contracts class. So it was really difficult, but I kept persevering, and I think that was the key. I worked even during the holidays and weekends. It wasn't easy to get from where I was being a high school dropout to where I am now. And as I mentioned, there were a lot of times I doubted myself. But you just have to keep going. And maybe you may not accomplish your goal at the timeline that you wanted to, but if you keep going, eventually you'll get there. The power of serving others is a great motivator and an even better reward. Janine Steele struggled in school, eventually was diagnosed with a learning disability, and then was able to make her way through college. But she found her direction after taking a class in criminal justice. I decided to become a lawyer the last year before I got my bachelor's degree. Um, when I was, uh, academics was not something that I was into <laughs> growing up. Um, my household was violent. Um, my family was kind of disruptive. I went to a lot of schools. Um, I had a lot of struggles. And so I dropped out of high school. And um, I went back to school. I was about 27, 28. And at that point, I was diagnosed. And I, I um, wanted to actually be a writer. I wanted to like write poetry and short stories. And I wanted to be an artist. And it wasn't until I was almost finished with my bachelor's degree, and I was almost 30 years old, that I decided that I would take a criminal law class. And at that point, I, it, it, the light went on. It was like, all of a sudden, it was like, I could have that sense of justice. Um, yeah. At that point, I just said, I decided to want to go to law school. Irenaeus Reus, a first-generation immigrant from a low-income family, talks about what success means to him. Considering my background and where my family came from as immigrants from the Philippines, to be able to be an attorney today, I would definitely consider myself to be a success. Um, but success for me means not just my own success as far as an individual attorney. I think my success is uh, part of how I've helped others achieve their goals in terms of attending law school, finding jobs after law school. And so that's really, really what I take the most pride in is helping others beyond my own success. Cindy Chang, who overcame discrimination because of both stature and race, became one of the youngest managing partners of a major law firm. She shares her definition of success. Success to me means accomplishing a personal goal or pursuing a personal passion, but 
it's not just um, achieving the personal goal or, or passion. It's something that also goes beyond yourself, which is making an impact on a community or some network or somebody else as well. That's what I think is a success. Lee Page, the oldest of 10 children from a working class family, looks back after achieving professional success. Stop occasionally and stop thinking about yourself and think about somebody else. Put a little time and effort into giving something to someone else. That's what will enrich your life more than anything else. Um, sure, we all like money. We all like material things, but I've never ever experienced anything that gave me as much pleasure, gave me as much a warm and fuzzy feeling as doing something for somebody else without the expectation of getting something in return. Dorothy Nelson, a federal appellate judge, the first female dean of a major American law school and a pioneer in peaceful problem solving, offers advice about finding happiness that you should try out things that you're most interested in. And one of those things should be caring about other people. You'll find that you have challenges that people make you mad or people hurt you. But to me, if you turn around and look around you and see somebody else who needs some help or needs a friend, and that you follow your own instincts not try to be in a profession just because of the money, but choose something that you are passionate about, that you like to do, that you know you want to do. Everybody has problems. Everybody has challenges. But I find in my own life, then if I look around and see if there's somebody that I might help, I forget about my own problems and I'm able to make some contribution to somebody else's life. And again, I talk about success meaning happiness. If you want to feel good in your heart, it won't be because you have a big house or a big car or all sorts of possessions. It will be because you are helping to make this world a better place in which to live. We hope some of these stories touched, helped, or inspired you. Believe in yourself, persevere, and pursue your dreams.